So you have another decision to make when you get to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Really, it's, it's verse 19, I suppose, but it's, it's the seventh trumpet, the seventh angel blowing his trumpet. And it's that decision, we've talked about this before, is are there interludes? Are there excurses? Does, does John break the pattern of the three sets of sevens in order to go off on, on tangents that he then comes back from? And I don't know that it's wrong to say yes, but I can't help but wonder if in doing so, you sort of miss, miss the big picture. Both of these places where this would happen is in the midst of the trumpets, although since this is the last trumpet, I guess you could say it's between the last trumpet or the trumpets and the censors of wrath. The other one's in the midst of the trumpets. The question I guess I have is why? What in the text makes it so that we believe this is the end? Aside from the fact that, I guess, there's a chapter break here, right? That the the monks put a chapter break here because it had been that much space. You know, they, they tended to not always do it where where there was necessarily a, an actual change in ideas. They tried to, but it was also about how much space you covered. That's why all the chapters are about the same length, yeah? So there is this chapter break here, and you do have an earthquake and thunder and heavy hail and rumblings and lightnings and things like that, which has happened a few times before in the book, and certainly has some end-of-the-world connotations. But again, those things also have cross connotations, over-the-cross connotations, uh, the, the fixing or the inversion of all things connotations. So I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm wanting a better argument than it just seems to stop here. Because I don't think it does. I think that the third woe, which is the seventh angel's trumpet, which, by the way, I don't, I don't believe we're ever told the third woe is passed. The third woe just kind of goes. The third woe has got to be a little bit more than just this song. And I think, I think generally that would be what people would say, too, that the song is maybe an interlude from the woes, that the woes and the trumpets are not lined up with each other. But I don't, I don't, again, I don't see why... We need to do that. Verse 14 says, The second was passed, the third is soon to come. It said that about the first, and then it went right into it with the sixth trumpet. So the seventh trumpet is the third woe, I think. And it's going to be a lot more than just the end of chapter 11 here. That's really where they should have put the break, I suppose. That the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. A little bit of the hallelujah chorus there. You start this woe with a picture that we've already seen. That the believers and the angels and all those who are in Christ are in heaven already, kept there with him, trusting in him, victorious in him, singing a song. And way back, way back when we did a, an episode where we just went through this song of the book of Revelation, and I believe we got to this, this text at that point. But there's a number of pieces here that, that they're not new. We're all kind of going back to that chapter 7 picture of the throne room and the, the uncountable masses surrounded and singing. As I say, chapter 4 through 7. Because verse 16, though, and this should really ring a bell, the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. Well, that's what they did before, right? They cast down their crowns around the sea and all that. And if you're new to the show, you should, well, you probably should go back and, and listen to the, the older Revelation stuff. Because I'm not going to try to prove to you again that these 24 elders are the patriarchs and the apostles at least symbolically speaking, that and that the patriarchs and the apostles, that is the, the tribes of Israel, Judah, Reuben, Simeon, uh, and the apostles, as two sets of twelve, are a symbol of, they're emblematic of, the entire people of God in the Old and New Testament eras, not by two different covenants, but before and after Christ, before and after Christ comes. So that the number twelve is the number of the church, and you have the number twelve twice. Not unlike the two witnesses, 
right, that we were talking about just recently. Well, these 24 elders, 24 faithful men who are the image of the church, what do they do in every case and in all times, knowing that Christ is God, that Christ shall reign, that the kingdom of the Lord has been achieved? Whether it's through prophecy about it will be achieved or whether we're looking back at the cross from where we stand now, this causes us to to fall back into our proper position regarding God, reverence, and to worship him, which is to ascribe to him what he is, who he is. So the song in verse 17 says, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Now, I suppose you can take that as the end of the world has come, and that's it. That's just the description. It's the end of the world now. But I think you can also take that as introduction to what comes next. They're singing about what is about to happen. They're, they're painting that bigger picture. And as we get into that bigger picture, there's, there's also this, it's this constant problem. It's, it's the Great Tribulation problem of wanting to think of the end of the world only as something that happens at the end of the world. As opposed to understanding that the end of the world happened in the cross of Jesus. The end of the world happened early in one man's body. In that sense, also, the new world, the next world, the life of the world to come, has begun already in one man's body. And that that breaking of the timeline in our heads, right, that is so key to the way that John is going to describe everything else that that happens right now. So, So what happens? Is it at the end of the world that God's temple in heaven will be opened and we're going to see the Ark of the Covenant? Or is it the birth of Christ? that God's temple in heaven is opened and we see the Ark of the Covenant within the temple, right? Yes, might be the answer. Although I, I don't know that the, the big moment on the last day is going to be the box, the old box with gold and all that stuff. I'm pretty sure it's still going to refer to Christ. This song and this revelation of the Ark well, actually, I, I got to say, the, the, the chapter break is just in such a terrible place. It's, it should, <laughs> the song is now going to be played out, and the first thing we see in the fulfillment of the song is the ark. Look, God's presence is doing what it needs to do. It's hidden behind earthquakes and hail and flashes of lightning, but here it is. He's going to do what it needs to do. And then chapter 13 starts. A great sign appeared in heaven, Right? With the Ark of the Covenant. They're not, this is not separate. You're still in heaven, right? Right. God's temple in heaven was opened. A great sign in heaven appeared. And But see, most people, they take this as like just a totally different shift. New direction, new thing, new story. Has nothing to do with it. But yeah, why? Because the monks put a chapter break there. That's why. So the song, again, prophesies. Here, here's the story that's going to be told. And, and remember, this is also the third trumpet becomes the fifth trumpet, ripple op, outward, sixth trumpet, ripple outward, seventh trumpet, right? We're just expanding the picture. It's the same picture. It's just getting wider, and it's all about the fall of Gog and Magog, which is about the luring of the devil to his damnation. The tricking of him. Not, not, not with lies. The tricking of him with truth. Right? That, that God would put a lure or a, uh, a temptation before him, which is not God is not tempting the devil with evil. The devil is evil. God is putting something that is good before the devil, which the devil cannot resist but try to make evil. And it is in that uh, that, that he has his undoing, that Gog will fall. And you gotta get a, you got to go back and look at Gog and Magog and where we looked at that uh, weeks and months ago. Long time ago, actually. <laughs> but this kind of brings us to another, another thought here. I th- and I think it's a major thought if we're going to understand the luring of Gog to his destruction. And it's it has to do with how do we view Christ on the cross with regard to 
does the devil think he's winning or does the devil think he's losing? Because somehow this lure, and this is what the next text for chapter 13 is going to show us, this lure of Christ being man was too much for the devil to resist. He thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. There is an opportunity here for me to win. Now in the Chronicles of Narnia, the way the white witch, who is representing the devil, sees this opportunity to win is by killing Aslan the lion. So so she believes that the she has triumphed and that the death of the lion, the death of Aslan will be uh, her victory will put her in charge. And there's something wrong about that, although it's not entirely wrong. And this is what I'm, I'm kind of getting at. I'm not sure it's entirely wrong. It might be a little bit of a both and. But it's that is a secondary thing at the very least. And this is because, at least I think, it is really clear that the devil wants Jesus to come down off the cross. He gets him there. But I, and that's the lure. Christ gives himself up of his own accord. But you know the devil's trying to get him on the cross. The devil enters Judas Iscariot in order to betray him. So there's no question about that. But I don't think he gets him there because he wants to kill him. I think he gets him there because he thinks that this is where he can tempt him to saving himself. Right. So so think about the the temptation of Christ in the desert. All three things are attempts to get Jesus to cease serving others and serve himself. Even his bowing the knee to serve the devil and receiving all kingdoms would be for his own sake, right? He's trying to say, look, look, you're a man, so do what men do. Serve yourself. And Jesus doesn't doesn't fall for any of it. And Luke tells us that the devil then flees or leaves until a more opportune time. Luke never really comes back and tells us when that more opportune time is. But I know for certain that the the words that are used in Matthew's account of the temptation, if you are the Son of God, do this. If you are the Son of God, do this. Those words do come back in the mouths of those wagging their heads at Jesus. If you are the Son of God, come down off that cross. See, and there's where the devil didn't want Jesus to die. The devil wanted Jesus to abandon saving mankind. And that that's the lure, though. He thought he could get him to do it. So that, like, he gets him to the point where he thinks that the death of Jesus, or the impending death, the suffering, the agony, will be too much, and he will give it up, right? And then thus it will all be the, the devil's, whether God goes somewhere else or not, the devil will have the world. And then it doesn't work. Jesus endures. For the joy set before him, he endures the cross, scorns at shame. He says, it's finished, I'm dead. Boom, right? And that's the lure. It's like, wait, and you have to think, you have to know that the devil, his eyes had to get big at that moment and be like, holy crap. As the the sword of the spirit like crushes his head with the spikes that are going through Jesus's heel. Like he didn't put himself in that position because he thought he he was actually going to be in that position. He's no fool. I'm not a big fan of psychoanalyzing the devil, but I'm pretty sure he's no fool. He's an idiot, but no fool. And, you know, he's wrong. He's wicked. No fool. So some of that's going on here a little bit, too, with this the, the luring of Gog. And, and then now the story is going to tell this. You're going to see it, that the the incarnation of Christ, the coming of the Ark of the Covenant out of heaven as Jesus is going to be the thing that Satan cannot resist. I said chapter 13 earlier, I meant chapter 12. Satan cannot resist it. Because this great sign appears in heaven. Amongst the the Ark of the Covenant and the the rumblings and the flashings, get rid of your chapter break, somehow connect to this, behind this, with this, as this. There's a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. It must be it must be Mary the Queen of Heaven for us to worship, don't you think? That's what this is about. No. <laughs> no. But it is Mary. It is Mary, and, and yet it's not Mary. It is the church. 
but it, it is the church and it is not the church. It is Eve, right? It is woman. It, it is humanity as bride of Christ, which that's going to come later as well. So you have this overlapping of realities that, that Mary is the singular individual who actually bears Jesus in her body, but every woman who has ever been in the bearing of children in their bodies carry the promise by which, or the means by which, Jesus as fulfillment came. And in that sense, every marriage is a picture of this, all humanity is a picture of this, and the church particularly, as those who believe in this promise and pass it forward to their children, is a picture of this. This is why we call the church she. She. The church has a feminine descriptor or description, a symbolization. And th- and this so this is her. This woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. Now now catch the clothing with the sun. This is so important. Because who's the one that's shining with the power of the sun just previously? This angel, right? His face is shining like the sun. And who's the one who actually does that? It's Jesus. So this woman now, is she, she's not shining with the sun. She's clothed with the sun. The sun has wrapped himself around her. Now the moon under her feet, I'm, I'm not as confident about. And I, I had, haven't had time, I'm not going to have time today to go, go dig into the moon. Other than, I know this, that the Old Testament calendar revolves around the moon. So I'm okay just throwing it out there that the law is under her feet, right? The Levitical codes, the Torah, uh, however you want to describe it, the old words, all of them, law and gospel, they are they are under her feet. They are they are her foundation. How firm a foundation he's saying to the Lord, yeah. I, I, that might be a stretch. I don't I I can't prove that one yet. But the being clothed with the sun is being clothed with the power of God, right? It, what is it? The the Holy One shall overshadow you, is what the prophecy is given to Mary, yeah. And then the fact that this woman has on her head a crown of 12 stars, well, we just talked about this, didn't we? What's 12 the number of? It is the number of the church. What are the stars in Jesus' hands from earlier in the book? Oh, yeah, they're the churches. Yeah, so here we have two of those images coming right back. So who is this? She's got a crown made up of church, <laughs> right? She's, she's the church. And if you want to see her as Eve or as Mary, that's fine. It's more that Eve and Mary are both pictures of the church than the other way around. The church is not a picture of Mary. Mary is a picture of the church. The church is not a picture of Eve. Eve is the picture of the church. And here, that picture, that woman, is revealed as a sign. A sign coming out of heaven. The promise that the seed would be born. Right? Verse 2 says she was pregnant. So now, here she is. I mean, she's glorious. Shining, moon under her feet, stars in her head, and then she's like crying out in the pains of childbirth. Which is like, whoa, wait, whoa, whoa, slow down, John. That's a, it's not a glorious picture in most accounts. It's like a, I mean, if you've been in a, a delivery room, it's it's intense. It's intense. Uh, uh, there, there's there's sweat, there's blood, there's yelling, there's uh, there there's uh, the man is always terrified, the woman is always focused. Right, it, it's uh, uh, it's intense, and, and that's what's happening here. Now we don't have the man present because the is the father who's overshadowing. But see, she's clothed with him, right? Clothed with the clothed with the clothed with the glory of God, but she's crying out in pain and the agony of giving birth, which is also its own kind of symbol. And Jesus speaks this way semi regularly, right? When he talks about the end of the world. And the tribulation that's come upon the world, he says, these are but the beginnings of birth pains. There is something about the redemption of mankind that giving birth is not only how it happens in Jesus, but also a picture of what it feels like when it happens. The fact that he will greatly increase the pain and childbearing, and yet it is the childbearing that brings about the salvation of the world. These things are not, they're not separate from each other. They're tied to each other. And so this this church that exists throughout history, this woman with the crown of 12 stars on her head, she is always in this state within history. Even after Jesus is born, right? We still remain in the midst of the birth pains of salvation, the birth pains of the great tribulation, uh, the agony of the cross even though Christ himself achieves it. But th- this is pretty key, right? So this woman is both sides of the, of, of the cross, Old and New Testament. 
That said, in pain with the child, who is Christ, right? struggling as the queen that Christ comes to redeem, but brought down low by the results of our sin, in that moment, another sign appears in heaven. That's verse 3. Behold a great red dragon, yeah, crimson. Not just a dragon. He's not a golden dragon. He's a red dragon. Red dragons are bad. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That, that's the way fantasy tends to work. I have no idea about the, the redness of the dragon here in Revelation and John's connection to it. But I do know this. I, I'm, I'm convinced now of this. I, and you can call me heretic if you want. This is the serpent, <laughs> right? Uh, this is the serpent in the garden. The serpent in the garden was not a garter snake. The serpent in the garden was not a boa constrictor. The serpent in the garden was a dragon. Uh, he is the devil. Uh, and this is him. The old worm, the old foe. Uh, I, w- what compels John to say it this way? Is it symbolic? Yes. So, so yeah, was he a lizard? No. Yeah. But he, he's an angel. He's an angel. He's a broken, fallen, rebellious, you know, uh, broken to the level of, you know, cannot be saved. Angel. And John says, well, the way to describe him is as a crimson beast, yeah, a crimson lizard of death, a crimson snake with legs. It's hard, though, at least for me, you know, I, the word dragon, I, I, when I was a kid, like I had my transformers and I had my dragons. Like I had plastic dragons, multiples of them. I loved my dragons. Right. I've, oh, I, I have a tattoo. I got it when I was 18 years old. It's on my right shoulder. You know what it is? Dragons. I've always just had a thing for dragons. I don't know why. I think a lot of people do. Maybe not quite as weirdly as to tattoo it on yourself, but but some people have tattoos of dragons. There's even a book, right? The one with the dragon tattoo, all that kind of thing. Anyway, I, I got a thing for dragons, but that means that I also have like an image of a dragon in my head, which has been created by a pile of images from a history of pop culture and pop media. All of those images exist after this text in Revelation and therefore do not inform it, right? It informs them. So what am I getting at is that the picture of a dragon that you think of when you hear the word dragon is probably not what John's getting at. Probably not. I mean, the idea that it would have wings, that's just not one the Bible gives us. Right. So and when I think of a dragon, it's always got wings. It's kind of what makes a dragon a dragon. It's a, it's a serpent with wings. But see, a, a dracon, believe it or not, that's actually the Greek word, dracon, is a serpent. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a serpent. That's what it is. So what's the difference? And where do we get this, this imagery from? Why does John use uh, dragon instead of just the word serpent, because there's, there's other words for serpent and snake. He's not saying that. Uh, he's saying something else. Because the regular word for snake only means snake, and, and dracon means more than that. So you're not going to get this from your regular lectionary or dictionary, Greek lexicon. Yeah, see what I did there? Lexicon, dictionary, lectionary. Oops. Yeah. You're not going to get this from your regular Greek-English lectionary, but Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which is a, is a pretty cool tool, it's a deep etymological word study tool for most of the words, important words in the New Testament. Not all of them, sadly, but I mean, it's pretty magnanimous kind of uh, work for someone to, to do this. And it's pretty key then there that he says it doesn't just mean serpent because it can also mean sea monster, right? So to see the dragon as also a, a sea beast and this gets us back to God versus uh, the sea dragon. Is that it? God versus the, yeah, God versus the sea dragon. Uh, that's a previous episode, right? And the, the grand history of seeing the great evil one, whether it's Tiamat, right? Or whether it's Poseidon, he's not quite evil, but he's, he's certainly cantankerous. The, the, the God of the sea as being close to the greatest God, but not really, but almost, and yet full of chaos. Yam, uh, the God of the Philistines, uh, that kind of stuff. So this word dracon, dragon, has that element to it. Of all the beasts, I'm just going to read here a little bit for you. Of all the beasts, the serpent was regarded as demonic in antiquity, 
thereby revealing the duality of the ancient conception of demons. It plays a great part in Persian, Babylonian, and Assyrian, Egyptian, and Greek mythology. It always has the same power, the power of chaos, which opposes God either in the beginning or at the end of things, or both. Thus, in Parsiism, there is the serpent Azi Dahaka. In, Babyl- uh, yeah. in Babylonian, Tiamat, who we mentioned, and Labu. In, in Egypt, uh, Apophis, the main symbol of the Typhon, with many others, like the crocodile. Yeah. In Greece, and uh, you had the Python, who Apollo defeats, and the serpent which Cadmus slays, and many mixed figures like Typhus and Typhon. I, I don't know much about those guys. There seems to have been a similar general estimation of the red color ascribed to the serpent, which then Revelation picks up on with its fiery red language. On Greek soil, the significance of the fight against the serpent as the original battle of deity against the power of chaos is greatly obscured by the lowering of the stories to the level of mere sagas. Right? So, so in most other religious backgrounds, this was like a god versus the great evil fight, but in Greek mythology, it's sort of just like a, a low-level couple guys doing this fight. On the other hand, the, the other aspect of the serpent as a demonic beast emerges more strongly than in Babylon and, and in Egypt. So it, it nonetheless is a, a stronger demon or a stronger understanding of the demonic side of things, uh, where in Babylon and Egypt, it was still a sacred animal. This dual capacity reveals the dual nature of the ancient demonology in general. Huh. It's pretty cool, huh? I, mean, I just want to keep reading. The intrinsically impressive view that Revelation is simply borrowing a definite myth breaks down not merely on differences in the conception of the role of Michael, uh, we're going to get to him, but more particularly in the fact that the image of the dracon does not occur only in the vision of Revelation 12, but is key for Satan in the entire book. It is more likely that the serpent has here become, along the lines of the radical depreciation of the demonic in the New Testament, a demonic animal representing Satan. Ah, I'm going to disagree with that one right there. So they're saying that this is just a, well, it's a symbol. That's what, that's what I was saying before, but... Uh, it's it's a symbol that is bigger than just a symbol. On the other hand, we should not overlink, overlook the link with the story of the serpent in paradise in Genesis 3. Yeah, there you go, guys. That's where, duh, right? Uh, the particular feature mentioned in Revelation 12, 15, namely that a stream of water gushes from the mouth of Satan is reminiscent of Babylonian conceptions, of which there are scattered traces in the Old Testament. The rabbis, too, see connections between the serpent and the world of the demonic. Uh, it goes on. There's, there's a bit more here. I'm not going to read any more. It just gives you a bunch of textual reference. I'm skimming it. It gives you a bunch of textual references. But so let's let's not miss this then, right? The dragon, this is where we kind of started. This dragon is not quite like the dragons we imagine with our fantasy literature. Although it's fine if that like helps you get, like uh, spark your imagination, but just keep in mind it it doesn't have wings officially. It's a sea dragon officially, a sea monster, like Leviathan. Yeah, which actually is quite spot on. The Leviathan and Job is, is this, right? Uh, it's a sea monster, the great deep abyss wickedness. And it is, uh, it is demonic. It is demonic and the ruler of all chaos. So we got, you know, Eve giving birth and screaming in pain. And then we have a demonic sea beast <laughs> uh, uh, coming out of, of heaven. Out of heaven. Yeah, the sign which appears in heaven. He's falling from heaven. This is all, and this is why it's like the timeline thing doesn't work. You can't be like, oh, this is before he fell out of heaven. No, he fell out of heaven when he tempted us. He he, he fell at that moment. It's all combined. And that same moment is the cross where he's destroyed. So you got to see it from from God's perspective, we're outside of time. And the story is outside of time. But all the images give us a way of comprehending the story as, as epic. Yeah. So, great, fire your red, Dracon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads, seven diadems, that is, seven crowns. So now, here we have him, well, with a holy number and a complete number. Isn't that something? Seven, the number of holiness. Ten, the number of completion. Here is this great fiery dracon with that as his number but see it's not really his number this is pretension on his head he has seven crowns right seven diadems he he is attempting to gain for himself the place of god and that's what that that this picture is 
by the way, you know, the, the picture breaks down as a picture so fast the moment you try to draw 10 horns on seven heads, right? I, have you ever seen these? Every once in a while, there's something like this. Someone will try to draw Revelation stuff, and you're like, wait, that doesn't work, <laughs> right? Well, it was, yeah, it would be three horns, three heads with two horns, and then seven heads with one horn. Very clever, but I, no, that's, that's not the, you're missing the point, right? The point is not to do that. The point is having seven heads, he's claiming holiness in his own head. Having 10 horns, he's claiming the power and authority as a complete thing that he owns. And you see this then that he's wearing these crowns. He's claiming to be royal. And in this claim, this appearance of him, verse 4, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Now remember what I said before, trumpet 3 expands to trumpet 5, expands to 6 and 7, right? Trumpet 3, star falls from heaven. Trumpet 5, star falls from heaven with the key to the abyss and unleashes the demons on the world. There you go, right? Here we are again. Now you have these demons coming out of the abyss are also other angels falling from heaven. And don't miss that it's a third. It's a third. I still remember, I said this one time in a Bible study, offhandedly, I'm like, you know, the devil took a third of the angels with him. And I had a, a sweet little old lady, God bless him. They love their Bible, they've learned their Bible their whole life long, and then they hear something they haven't heard before, and they think, uh, you know, they, they get a little angry about that. It's kind of weird sometimes. So she's like, whoa, where is that? Where is that written? I've never heard that before. Well, okay. <laughs> it's right here. <laughs> um, you know, in the middle of a very confusing book, uh, filled with confusing things. And frankly, I, I do not believe he, he actually took 33.33333333 forever 3% of the angels, like there's not a one-third fallen angel running around somewhere. So we got to stick with our understanding that these numbers are symbolic. But, so what is a third? And I think we've already covered this, but we'll cover it again. A third is less than half and more than a quarter. That's what a third is, right? It is, it is a significant minority. It is not a majority, that'd be more than half, and it's not, as, it's not moving toward insignificant minority, that'd be less than a quarter, like get to the fifth or an eighth, you're like, yeah, what's that, right? But you know, I mean, if really, you look at a dollar, and you got the quarter, like, okay, uh, that's not very much. No, no, it's big enough, I'll keep it, yeah. But you move up, we don't have a 33-cent piece. But 50 cents, you're going to keep that 50-cent piece, right? So it's between those things. And it's, so it's enough that it matters, but it's not enough that it, it ends all things. Yeah. So, and his tail is the thing that does this. This is the draconic nature of his serpentine uh, diabolicalism. Yeah. Uh, he sweeps them with himself, and and they're all cast to the earth with him. Which again, remember, we've just seen this from another perspective: the the hordes of locusts uh, pouring out everywhere, uh, the, the the scorpion powers and the war horses and all this, all this tribulation that they bring. We're just looking at it from another direction now as this, it's just, that's just a flash now, right? Everything that we took before, did I snap? There it comes. Yeah, everything that we took before, now we're supposed to pour that into this, right? Just with a flash, just a, a third of them fall to the earth, and he stands before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. There it is. There's the lure. It's the lure of Gog. He waits. He doesn't destroy humanity First, because he's being told he can't, the, the book has established this several times that the angels who are to destroy the earth are being held back until the seal of the living God can be put on the foreheads of his servants, right? That kind of language. But also, he doesn't know that he's being held back. He's also, he thinks, it's good, it's good, I can be held back because I'm waiting because there's going to come a time, there's going to come a time when I can devour this child. I can devour the faith and the future and the seed and the hope of mankind. And so I'm waiting and tormenting this woman, but only because I believe I'm going to get something greater from this. So how does it get more epic than this? How does it get more epic? You have, you have the queen who is humanity. You have the fallen archangel and all his third of heaven. And you have them set against each other in a moment in which she is going to win by giving birth, yet he believes he will win when she gives birth. Because he believes that when she gives birth, he may kill, and yet it is because he kills that he loses, and that the one, the male child, 
wins. It's so cool, right? Verse 5, she gave birth to a male child. A man. Man, do we, do we need to talk about what that means these days? Do you know what that means? I mean, there are those who would accuse us of, of doing violence to Jesus of Nazareth by saying he was a male simply because he had uh, male genitals. Right? And uh, this is something we've got to stop doing as a species because it's so... They, they, call it, they call it violence. Violence and trauma and all this stuff. Dear heavens, isn't it crazy that we have to live in a time where, where I, I got to say that? She gave birth to a bouncing baby boy, right? right? There, there's a difference. There's a difference, and it's pretty obvious to anybody who looks and isn't trying to push some sort of anti-existence agenda and uh, pro-death agenda on the world. Which, I'm sorry, if, if you are struggling with those issues in your life, you don't realize that you're, you're part and parcel of a pro-death agenda. Well, any time that we give ourselves over to sin, we're giving ourselves over to a pro-death agenda. But the centrality of abortion behind all of this nonsense with our sexuality in American culture in the 21st century, the centrality of abortion makes it even more an agenda of death. It's so evident. It's so evident. 300,000 plus murdered every year just by Planned Parenthood, and that's only a third of the abortions in the U.S. That's only the U.S. It's not the planet. And we're spreading this stuff as if it's mission work. Dear heavens. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Right. So so here, here he is, and the devil's ready to eat him. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. He can't do it. He can't eat him. Instead, he ascends to heaven. So you just have the death and resurrection of Jesus there, even though it doesn't say it real explicitly. But you do. Incarnation. He rules. Where is he crowned? Where is he crowned? King. The cross. And then he ascends. He's caught up to God, to the right hand of God, to the throne of God. Yeah? Now, I do feel that because it mentions rod of iron, we do need to do a little Old Testament here because I know this one's, I know what this one is. I know what to go, where to go look for it. And it is is really key. Psalm 2 is a psalm that doesn't get a lot of psalm love. Uh, it's not going to be on a whole bunch of Hallmark postcards and and things like that because it's a it's a military psalm. I and mean, this thing is it's kind of violent. Uh, it's kind of powerful. And it's, it's so important. It's number two. The structure of the psalms, we, d- we did a little bit of this, uh, you know, last year. Not not a lot, but a little bit. The structure of psalms is kind of a confusing thing. Because, you know, many different authors, and then there's somebody who kind of put them all together in an order. And I don't know that we can say that the order is inspired or not. I, well, I'll debate that, and if you want to say the order is inspired, that's fine. I'm okay with it. I'm willing to submit to that even. I, just, I haven't ever seen it proved in any way. But the order was definitely done, you know, after the exile. So that's kind of where the challenge comes in. But even though the order was done after the exile, it might not be an inspired order. All the Psalms that are there, they're definitely the inspired word of God. And then the order is at least, at the very least, it's a confession of something about them and their place in our faith. And again, Kyle and Dale do a pretty good job of kind of picking at that. I don't pretend to even have my mind around most of it, but I can tell you this. Psalm 1 is definitely there on purpose because it's the, it's the gateway to the entire book, right? The, the man uh, of God, the man who is righteous, is a tree planted by streams of water. To have God's word underneath you is to make you one who prospers and bears fruit. You're blessed, not by wickedness, nor sin, nor scoffing, but by the Torah, the revelation of God, which you meditate on day and night. And the wicked... Those who reject that Torah, that revelation, that law and gospel, well, they're not going to stand in the judgment. But the way of the justified one, the way of the righteous, that's you. You know, The Lord knows that way and brings that way to you. Blessed is the man, blessed are you. That's the entry to the Psalms. You know, you need the Word of God. Here it is. Pray it. And isn't it funny, the circular thing here, but it's real. You need the Word of God is something the Word of God says. So which word of God is it? Well, it starts with the one that you need the word of God, right? That is a big part of it. There is more. It gets more concrete, more narrow. But that is, that's a huge starting place. Psalm 150 is also there on purpose. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia to the end. Lots of praise and glory. And it's, it's, it's kind of the, the, the capstone of it all. And there's other places along the way that there's some markers that are left. But Psalm 2 is then the first psalm that is not the first psalm. And it is in many ways like the backside of Psalm 1. Right? So 
the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Well, now here is here is the first image we get of the actual righteous one. And it is a prophecy and a song about the king. King again in Hebrew <clears throat> is is Melech, but the only way you become a king if you are a Hebrew is that you must be Christed, Messiahed, right? Anointed into the kingdom. So the king is the Christ. He's the Christ, the christened one. Yeah? And in this first psalm about the christened one, we're going to get this bit about the rod of iron. Yeah? Why do the nations rage? Verse 1 asks. Why do the peoples plot in vain? It's an open question. Why is it that the world is in chaos? Why is it that people cannot understand or see that the world is in chaos? Why is it that the kings of the earth set themselves together and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his Messiah, against his Christ? Isn't that weird that all the powers in the world have united themselves against Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth, and against the king he has chosen? And what they say is they set themselves against him. Here it is, Gog and Magog again, right? What are they trying? What is the devil trying to achieve? And what are we trying to achieve in our sin with the devil? We are saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. That's the bonds that God has put on us, the boundaries God has put on us, the wrap, the holding, the place, the vocation. But to be under the devil, to be one of the nations, one of the goyim, truly, one of, one of the Gentiles that is not a Gentile by blood, but a Gentile by unbelief, is to seek to burst the bonds, to get away from what God has said will be. Verse 4 says that he who sits in the heavens, that, that's God, that's Jesus, he sees this, he's watching all this, and he laughs. Now, this isn't like a belly laugh, like, oh, oh, oh I'm having a good day. I'm a smiling, happy person. I've, I've shared this before. You may have heard this before. I remember my last year of seminary, this, God bless the guy, his classmate, uh, or maybe it was the second year, a couple years behind me, but you know, he's wearing this t-shirt and he's got like a picture of this guy with a beard and long hair. So it has to be Jesus because that's, that's, that's what we know about Jesus. More than anything else is certain, we know he had a beard, beard and long hair. In fact, anybody who has a beard and long hair, they look like Jesus, don't they? Right? What a what a joke that is. Any, anyhow, he, he, he's there. He's got his beard and long hair on the t-shirt, and he's laughing. He's so happy. He's so happy. He's just, look at Jesus, the loving Jesus. He's such a happy Jesus with long hair and a beard. And then it said, he who sits in the heavens laughs, Psalm 2, 4, 2 verse 4. And I remember looking at that and being like, I don't think that's what that says. <laughs> I don't know, though. I should go look that up. And a buddy of mine, I think, pointed it out to me and, and, and then pointed me to this. And he said, look, they, he's not laughing because he's happy. It's not, it's not trying to tell you that your God is a nice, happy, cheery guy. He's, he's holding them in derision. That's the rest of the verse. He's scoffing at them. You know, it's kind of like, can you imagine if the anthill outside your house decided it was going to mutiny against you? They're like, this year. This year, we're going to stop that man from living in that house. We're going to take over. We're going to live in that house ourselves. Not just like and invade it. We're actually going to be sleeping in his bed, eating his food, drinking his beer. Like, if you heard the ants saying this to themselves in their little ant language, what would you do as you went for your can of raid, right? You'd be like, yeah, right, little ants. Not a chance. And that's kind of what's going on here. So when God looks down... And he sees the nations, the kings, the rulers all saying, well, well we're going we're gonna to throw God off. We're going to stop the Christ from ruling the world. He's just like, <laughs> yeah, you don't know how stupid you sound. You, you can't fathom. The fact that you're sounding that way means you can't understand how stupid you sound. Then, verse 5, he, the Lord now, will speak to them, those who are rebelling against him in his wrath, and terrify them in his fury, saying, well, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, I don't know. For the Christian, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill is not terrifying nor furious, right? But see, see, if you're one of the kings of the earth, if you are uh, the serpentine sea monster trying to overthrow the king set on Zion permanently and unmovably, the foundation on which the new world will be, that is sort of a terrifying thing if you can't get through his shield. 
And now it, the, the psalm then turns, and this is one of the challenges with the psalms. They go from third person to first person sometimes, and they don't really tell you why. David, in, in one sense, is doing this because, I think this is from David, because uh, it is what God said to him, but it's not really about him. David knows it's also about the Christ. This is the whole point of the Acts 2 Pentecost sermon from Peter, right? David's dead. Jesus isn't, so it's all about Jesus. But he says, I will tell of the decree about being a king, right? Which is what this psalm's about. Be, being the king set on Zion against which the nations cannot uh, overthrow. So lest they overthrow God, God won't let it happen. He laughs at it. I will tell of this decree. The Lord, Yahweh, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the heritage your nations, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now you got two images there that both kind of, they're separate, but they, they get brought together. The first is this rod of iron. And in Hebrew thought, a rod of iron was a tool for punishing. Yeah, or, or especially held in the hand of a king. It was a demonstration of his despotic ability, total authority, able to do anything it needs to do and unable to be stopped from that. So, you know, as an, another example of just the value of iron, historically, this is the metal that changes everything, militarily speaking, right? Once you got iron as a sword, Anybody who's working with bronze, they can't, they can't deal with you. It's just, it's just too hard. It's too unbreakable, too unshatterable. You see this a little bit, I believe, is in one of the, the beasts that Daniel describes, which ends up being Rome, and the iron of his jaws. Yeah, he just crushes everything he chews on. So you have that first, this, this great strength, this thing that cannot be, be cracked. And then you have... A, a clay pot, which is about the most brittle thing you can really have. I mean, they're very valuable historically, too. Without clay pots and the development of pottery, uh, humanity would have struggled in a lot of different ways, right? It lets you get water, lets you keep oil, lets you, lets you keep grain. Pretty, pretty cool thing, but they're brittle. You drop a pot, it breaks. Kind of like dropping a glass. And then glass is a, a similar thing uh, in a lot of ways, really. So you could really just replace this with that image, right? With your, your water glass that you, you crack in the sink or something like that. But now he's taking this rod of iron, this great military strength, and he is dashing it into this pot so that it shatters. And this is a image of what the king, who is the Christ, will do to the rebels, to those who plot and rage and set themselves as if to free themselves from God's reign and God's power and God's rule and God's, God's creation, God's order. That's why it is a, a terror to say, look, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And then the king says, yep, here I am. I got a rod of iron and I've been told I'm going to break stuff with it. Remember, this is just Psalm 2. He's just saying, like, this is just real. This is the way life is. This is the... You, Psalm 1, you need more of God's word. Psalm 2, <laughs> we're in rebellion and we cannot actually win. Verse 10 says, therefore, kings, be wise. Be warned, you who rule the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice. Right? Be comforted in your trembling. Be comforted to know that this Christ is indeed victorious over all his enemies because he's going to fight for you. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled, but blessed are all who take refuge in him. And don't miss the closing of Psalm 2, blessed are all who take refuge in him, and it's parallel to Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Yeah? Now, all of this is just to try to help us understand that in Revelation 12, verse 5, when the woman gives birth to a male child, he is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, there's a reference point. Who's she giving birth to? Well, the only begotten Son of God, the heir to David's throne, the one who has the power to destroy chaos. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. 
Right. So there's this this sweeping away thing here. Was, Wait a minute, wasn't this the end of the world? Yes, it was. This was the end of the world. And yet it didn't end. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Right. So in the desert, desert, wandering in the wilderness. You know, who else wandered in the wilderness? Do I need to tell the whole Exodus story for you? Yeah? Do I, do I need to explain to you how the wilderness is a picture of our sinful condition and of our waiting for the promised land, which is yet to come? Well, this is where the church always is. The woman always is there. Even when the Israelites got into the actual land way back in the day, they were still in the wilderness of sin, death, and the power of the devil. But she also, we also have a place prepared for us by God that is faith in the one who's coming, the words, the promises, the, the knowledge of this male child who will overcome the serpent. And in that knowledge, in that place, she, the church, you and I, are to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, does that ring a bell? 1,260 days is exactly the same amount of time that the two witnesses prophesy. It's 42 months, it's three and a half years, it's half of seven one on each side of the cross, right? Two periods of time, one on each side of the cross. It is a number of incompletion, a number of waiting, and yet a number of of knowing that there is an end, right? So the 42 years spent in the wilderness by the people of Israel. Yes, it was 40, but it was 42 when you include the whole Exodus. Yeah? This is all just a picture of our current great tribulation. When you catch in that, how over and over again, by symbol piled upon symbol piled upon symbol, all with Old Testament reference, he is just describing what the New Testament and other clearer texts so clearly says. That we walk upon a sinful planet, a broken, a fallen, a dying planet, and that the only hope we have is the incarnate Christ who will overthrow our enemy, the devil, who has overthrown our enemy, the devil, in, in the devil's attempts to destroy him. He, in fact, loses. The next verse, now a war arose in heaven. See, again, this is where people then will take this and they'll say it's a different story. No, it's not a different story. This is, it's all going on at the same time. Michael and his angels fighting back against the dragon is happening at the same time. It's happening at the cross. It's one great cosmic inversion point. And again, the seventh trumpet here, start to finish. And I think we're still in the seventh trumpet. No excursus. Start to finish is looking at this luring of Gog, the story of the casting down of the dragon, all from one glorious, spinning, symbolic perspective. I have a statue in my house of the Archangel Michael. And he's got a big old spear in his hand. And the spear is pointed down at the maw of this a dragon, like a Western-style dragon, wings and all curled up underneath him, snarling, but, but beaten and about to be pierced. I have another statue in my house. It's a crucifix. Jesus dying on the cross, pierced. It's the same picture. But to get into that, you're going to have to come back next week. Actually, you're going to have to come back in two weeks because <laughs> next week we get a special special edition. It's Thanksgiving. Uh, I needed to take a little break and, and get away with my family. I haven't had a vacation in about six months at all, like, like any downtime. So we're, we're going to take a, a week here. But uh, Pastor Brian Wolfmiller and I did get to sit down earlier this week and have a what ended up being a pretty cool conversation. Sadly, we lost. I said that like it was surprising. It wasn't surprising. I, I'm I'm disappointed because we lost the first 15 minutes or so of it. But we were able to kind of bring it back. We're going to talk about the, the practice of creativity, and uh, pr- with particular, particularly with regard to writing. But if you're any kind of a creative person, uh, this will be interesting to you. And then we're also going to get into, with that, you know, writing theology and some of the issues that he's looking at for his next book, which I'm trying to convince him he's going to change the name of it. But you can you can listen to all that all next week. That'll come out on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, so make sure you, make sure that when you're you're sitting there with all your tryptophan high asleep and you got your iPhone ready to auto download uh, raw and, uh, and and pop that thing in, uh, even while you're watching football, it might be worth listening to. Yeah. All right. So uh, we'll see you in two weeks with Michael and the Dragon. Oh, such one of the best parts of Scripture. And in the meantime. Enjoy your time with family and giving thanks to the Lord for all that he has done for us. We'll catch you soon. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? 
If so, Pastor Fisk and his family would love to have it, in part to pay for technology and paperwork to keep Rev Fisk Raw going, and in part to just enjoy a night out together. Pledging $1.25 on Patreon, only $5 a month, lets the worker know his labor is appreciated. And if you're a true fan, you can give even more. You can find the link to Patreon in the show notes. And check out the other giving levels there, including advertising your product, your family, or your congregation on Rev Fisk Raw. Lock and load, then rock on.